Hello everyone, I'm Bill Harris and this is Life Questions, a viewer-centered program that focuses on viewer questions about life. The questions that you send us certainly reflect the many complex questions about life these days. We are joined now by our panel of local pastors and ministry leaders who we have assigned to research your questions and discuss their findings on today's program. And I would really love for you to meet them. We've got a power pack program in store for you today. First off, we have Jeff Pinkleton, Executive Director of the Gathering of the Miami, Miami Valley, that is, the Miami Valley uh, in Springfield, Ohio area, followed by Phil Elmore, who is a former pastor, now Area Director of Man in the Mirror, based out of Covington, Ohio. Next, we have Patrick Kammer, who is with the Westminster Church, Westminster Christian Church of Lima, Ohio, where he is the pastor. And rounding up our panel today is Pastor Alan Sudman of Union Chapel Missionary Church, where he is the very fine pastor himself. Okay, now let's get into our discussion today. As you know, we're looking at viewer questions to determine where we're going to go. In this question, it asks, do you have recommendations on how to stay on God's path? You know, Bible verses, podcasts, whatever you might come up with. How about we um, start that off with you, Jeff? Well, you can't okay. tee it up okay. and say <laughs> podcast, and I don't jump in and share my own. Okay. So I do have a podcast called the Pinkleton Pull Aside Podcast, um, which we have platform guests, authors, speakers, athletes, comedians, the like. Um, you know, I'll tell you, a great, a great tool that I don't know how many, if you guys use it, I, I, I'm using it more and more all the time, is the YouVersion Bible app, you know, from the verse a day, which I thought I was graduated way past that. Mm -hmm. And the Lord told me about a month ago, no, you haven't. You need the verse of the day, the little devotional that goes with it. I, I make up the little graphic. Uh, that graphic, by the way, on a daily Bible verse would make a great bookmark. I don't know if you guys <laughs> ever thought about that, but it, that would make a great bookmark. Um, and then you know, there's a bunch of daily devotional plans. I mean, one of the things we're doing within a gathering is we're having people um, sign up and doing a seven-day devotional timeline with version. Mark Batterson has the 40-day draw the circle thing. I think uh, I'm finding for me it's very helpful in my own devotional life and growing in Christ when I'm doing it either online, texting, the Signal app, and just connecting with people uh, that way. So, and then, you know, there's obviously lots of sermons out there. Uh, there's probably two people I, I listen to a lot, but, um, you know, biblical content, as we use that term in a gathering a lot, there's so much biblical content out there. You know, we're never going to be, be able to go before a holy God and say, ah, uh, you didn't give me enough tools. Mm -hmm. They're there. It travels, I think, and go into the right spaces where you can yeah. spend time alone with the Lord. I like cemeteries. Go figure that. But, uh, you know, whatever that space may be, coffee shops, a lot of places to get some Jesus time. Amen. Amen. Who else? Pathways to God. What do you think? What I have an unpopular answer, so I'll let you guys go. Wow. Uh, let let me jump in real quick. Can I jump go, in? Go right in. Uh, just like Jeff said, there is an abundance of material out there. It's at our fingertips. But at the end of the day, I think it's a matter of the heart. You know, we have to want to be in that relationship, and we need to be intentional about it. Uh, you can have all the tools you want, and... Check them off the box each week as you do it, but if it's a matter of the heart. You have to want to be in that relationship with God, and to, and that's not, you know, popular so to speak. But you have to be intentional about it. Pastor Suds, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I love that. that. That's all right. Yeah, use that more. That's what they used to call like him in, yeah. in college. He, yes. he told me. I like it. But I think one of the things in that question is to keep on the path, mm. and. Uh, you know, you're never going to see a guy walking a high wire with a backpack on his side because <laughs> it throws your balance. Sure, and I think sure. we have to empty ourselves. Instead of just say, read more Bible, don't forget to hear music, worship, pray. All of a sudden, I'm filling my backpack, mm -hmm. but it has to empty a little mm -hmm. first. And we, need, we just need to understand the whole success of Jesus was it started with to be crucified. And he needed to empty himself, even Philippians says, you know, to even come to earth. He had to make himself nobody That's right. to take on the form of a man. Good point. So I think, you know, and one thing I tell pastors and they kind of get frustrated is to write a sermon. The first thing I have to do is pray myself empty. Because mm. sure, I know what to say. Okay. And I know who needs to say it. And I, no, 
God knows what to say. God knows who needs to hear it and what he wants to say. Yeah. And so we need to be empty, but then there needs to be <laughs> motivation. And so of all the Bible verses and all the things, and I, I like what you said about the, uh, the app on the phone, but promises move us forward. Problems mm. stare us in the face. Every day we got our own giants, we got our own crises, we have our own physical ailments. But promises move us forward. And so I would encourage people, if you're going to read the Bible, a promise book, that book is pretty big, 66 books. But to have a promise book and look up today anxiety or anger, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that'll help move me forward, especially if I'm willing to empty myself. No. That's great. Discipline mm. is greater than motivation. Mm. You can have any pick of any tool that's out there, and there are myriad tools out there but you have, to, you have to want to do it. And you have mm -hmm. to, in some cases, make the time to get up in the morning or stay up late at night or whatever the case may be and make that a part of your, of your discipline. It's, it's like anything else. Like, do, you wanna, do you wanna lose weight? You have to show discipline in eating and exercise. If you wanna accomplish anything, you have to show discipline in whatever it is that you're doing. Um, following God in a, in a certain respect is, is not that much different. You have to be able to push through the times where you don't want to feel like it, or you don't feel like it, or oh, I'm really busy today. I, I really don't have, you know, do, do something, prayer, a, a, a 10 minute devotion, but you have to, as you said, stay on the path means you have to keep moving on that path mm -hmm. and just instilling that discipline. It's not, it's not the popular answer. It's not the, uh, you know, the, the, the fun answer, but it's important because if you don't have the discipline and if you don't instill the discipline it doesn't matter how many podcasts are out there it doesn't matter how many conferences you go to mm. it doesn't matter how many different uh, translations of the bible that you have it doesn't matter if you don't take time to read any of them to listen to any of them so that discipline and instilling that on a daily basis that's how you grow that's how you become more of a follower of christ and the good news is is that the more you do it the easier it gets well i was gonna say to that patrick i think too uh, we've, we've made the word discipline a negative word th that it shouldn't be and I think we had a speaker recently at our retreat, Jerry Denninger, who's the number two guy for Athletes in Action. And he, he used a great marriage analogy. I hadn't heard anybody say it quite like he did before about pursuing Jesus. He said he, he wakes up every morning and he prays, God, give me a greater passion to pursue you today. Mm -hmm. And it's just a simple prayer. But he said, you know, you think about your wife. He goes, are, are, are you not in a good, healthy marriage? Probably having multiple conversations. I mean, my wife and I have texted like today about our cat. You know, it, it's, the, it's the cat. It's whatever it may be having regular communication throughout the day. Mm -hmm. He goes, you know, um, at night or whenever, hopefully you're getting a little bit longer conversation. You know, over the course of a week, hopefully you have a date night. He goes a couple times a year, maybe four times a year, maybe once a year, you're going on a vacation together. And he said, you know, it, we, we try to overcomplicate this sometimes and we would treat Jesus no different than we do our wife. You know, multiple, lots of communication throughout mm. the day, you know, weekly at date night, you know, getting away for several hours, you and the Lord, and then, you know, like I know for me, I try to do that. I go multiple places, but uh, it's the old, I'll quote Mark Batterson again, the old change of pace plus change of place equals change of perspective. And Jesus clearly did that. Mark 135, there's other passages about getting up early in the morning. He got away and went away and did that for extended periods of time. Could you give me that again, the change of pace? Better? Change of pace plus change of place equals change of perspective. That's Mark Batterson. I still haven't taken credit for it yet. I could, <laughs> nobody's gonna know, but it was Mark Batterson. We'll put it on a bookmark. Bookmark, <laughs> make it for me, Patrick, I want it. <laughs> there you go. You, you know the old saying, when you're quoting somebody else, you say, well, it, it's so-and-so used to say, and then a few years later you say, well, as I always say. You know who you know, takes credit for that is John Maxwell. <laughs> John Maxwell <laughs> does a lot of that. He goes, you'll even, I'll use some of your quotes and you're gonna pay me when I use them later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, here's another question that I wanted us to get into. What factors should a person be looking for when shopping for a church? Shopping for a, cool a church. Nickname. <laughs> a cool nickname. A cool nickname. Of the pastor or the church? The pastor. Well, I mean, the church, I suppose, could have a, well, you want to watch that because there's a lot of places that spring up the, the flow, the river, the source. It's well, like, everybody mm -hmm. in Allen County is going to Allen's church if his nickname's Suds. I mean, who's not going and... Jesus Want to be Sud. washed clean? Yeah. Go to Pastor Sud's church. The soul Community Church. That's where the soul gets revived. 
There you go. There you like go. It, it really isn't on the catchy phrases. If you want genuineness, you got to look for genuine. That's a little hard to see in a formatted service. And I really think that the key answer, if if the if the person shopping for a church is serious about the Lord and, and close to the Lord, you got to ask His will. Because there may be a place you feel comfortable, but God may want to stretch it. God may want to put you in a place. Uh, as I coach churches, what kind of pastor are you looking for? I remind them, God has an idea too. Let go of your idea and, and see what kind of pastor God wants you to have. He may stretch you into a direction you've never thought of going. But So, you know, there's a lot of things you want to look for. But I, I think, are the people real? And does anybody notice me? I mean, there's got to be some... I don't know if I want to use the word family, but warmth. Oh. Uh, the first time you walk in, there's there's got to be some warmth. But uh, I personally, I know, and we have PowerPoint and scriptures on the screens, but I still like it when people bring their word because they're going to need that sword the rest of the week. Yeah. And uh, so often you visit a church and they go, what would you bring that for? We got it on the screen. Yeah, but... I need to mark in it. I need to have it. I need to hold on put to it. Put a bookmark in it. Put a put a bookmark in it. So, uh, <laughs> so but. It, it, it easy to say too. Like I'm, I'm just thinking. Like we talked about this a little bit before we got on air here. But do, do the people here love Jesus? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. I, I'll never forget. I consulted for a church a number of years ago, and it's a, it was a church of like 2025. 20, and I asked them our first meeting when I was consulting with them, like, what do you guys do really well? The majority answer was. Um, we're a very friendly, welcoming, warm church. I'm like, and people, we love people. I'm like, I 2025, it ain't that many. And I said, so how many of you guys have been in somebody else's home in a church? Maybe a few people went up for one. Mm -hmm. I said, how many of you have been in three or more people in this church's house? Nobody could say it. I said, so mm -hmm. what's the measuring stick about how you're loving people? But I think if you love people well, and I mean, I think that's a starting point, but clearly we're probably gonna have to carry this one on because this is a lengthy answer to this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's, it's a multifaceted question. Again, I think the things that you do want to look for is you want to look for that. All, and it's going to, some of these cases are going to take some time, like authenticity. It might take a little bit to find that out. Are they warm? That won't take quite as long to find out theoretically. I, I was pulpit supply for a church here. This has been a few years ago. And one of the things they liked saying was the first time, the first time you're here, you're a guest. The second time you're here, you're a family which sounds really nice and then i yeah, got to a out. point where i was uh, i was counseling the pastor each week because of how mean the people were so i thought mm, maybe i don't want to be part of this family and sometimes that connotation of family is can be problematic depending on your family background but that's another question to ask or to answer another day but i would say that the uh, the the attention to scripture um, you know, is, is the Bible being preached in there? And I know that sounds like a, a silly thing to think about in a church. It's like, well, of course the Bible's being preached in this church. It's a church, right? Yeah. Well, no, not that in every so. case and not in every circumstance. A lot of times the pastor likes to get on there and will give you his two cents on what he thinks about what's going on in the world and what we should do to fix it and all that kind of things. Like, okay, great. What, where are we getting that from? Are we getting into scripture? Are we getting into the word of God at all? And a lot of churches are not doing that. And you don't want to be in part of those because your spiritual growth is going to suffer long term. I always like to look when I'm visiting a church to see if they have their statement of faith, you know, their doctrinal beliefs, mm -hmm. because, you know, I, I think that's pretty important, especially in today's society. Oh, yeah. How do they feel about this subject? How do they feel about this? What are they standing on? So on and so forth. Because everything else, a lot, is just personality driven in the church. Mm -hmm. And personalities change, they come, yes. people come and go. Yes. But really, are they founded on scripture? And otherwise, I, for me, that's where it begins. Everything else can kind of get backfilled, so to speak, but yeah. Okay. Well, this looks like a good place to take a break, so why don't we pause and do that? And uh, when we come back, one of the viewers uh, wrote in wanting to know what do we do about people who feel that they don't need to be saved because they're not doing bad things? How do we, how do we deal with that? We'll deal with that and, and more questions when we come back. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. 
You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pasture suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. Well, thank you for hanging in. We are back and uh, another question we have from a viewer. Um, factors of shopping for a church and also there was the question that somebody asked about I don't feel that I need to be saved because I'm not that bad a person anyway. So those two may seem a bit non-related but I think we can put those into the same question. Can we not? Well yeah you know? I, I, I think for me I mean I, I love staying on the, the church thing a little bit when shopping because especially okay. with with Alan slash Suds <laughs> and Patrick being here, I mean, I think, you know, we talked off air a little bit about, um, you know, preaching. We talked about um, the, them as a leader, character, integrity. I mean, we've seen so many church leaders fall in recent years. I mean, you think about any given year, you could, you could go into the Google search and type in pastor falls whatever year you want. And there's probably gonna be multiple things that come up. Um, you know, some just heartbreak, breaking, gut wrenching ones, the stress, the mental health, the suicide, the stuff that goes with it. So I think uh, the lead pastor or multiple pastors in a church play a role. And I've said it before. I mean, I've, I've, I've ran a couple nonprofits. I've been involved in boards. I've done a number of leadership things. So the leader of a church and integrity and how they lead, humility as a servant, as a speaker, that's going to carry weight for me. And I think we kid ourselves sometimes if we think, you know, yeah, worship's important. Yeah, whatever's important. But I think who that pastor is, is a leader, carries a lot of weight. How do they lead their home? Um, and then, you know, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear feedback from you guys on that. Well, you've been doing this longer than me. I'll defer to you. <laughs> well, you, you want to be able to watch the man and know, is he really in the word? Because where he stumbles is we could come up with 30, 40 minute topics, never get into the word. I want to be able, the people who come to my congregation, come to the service. They, I want them when they walk out, they know I know the word, I've been in the word, it's fresh, and there's a connection. Not, there's a connection here, there's a connection vertically between God and me. And so I, I think that's uh, the thing that where pastors begin to fall is their eyes are on themselves and not in the word. If you're in the word, there should be days the word's a little painful because it's mm -hmm. true and it cuts mm -hmm. like a knife or a sword. Two-edged sword, in fact. Two-edged sword, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you, you, you'd always think that, well, everyone should be able to get along fine without me. In terms of, like, say, pastoral transitions, things like that. But the reality is that the times when church congregations tend to split or change uh, greatly in terms of makeup is when there's a pastoral shift. A lot of times people will, you know, oh, okay, well, I'm going to check out of this church with that, with the outgoing pastor, maybe go where he goes, or just this is my, this is my chance to jump ship. They were waiting for that for some reason. And then you'll have people that when there's a new pastor comes in, well, they'll, they'll swell. I was part of the, uh, I was part of the transition at Lyman Community here about 10, 9, 10 years ago when uh, Dr. Doug Boquist came in as pastor and we saw our numbers swell because they want to check out the new guy and see what what he's like. And we think, oh, you know, you shouldn't do that. There should be other these things that go in there. And there should, but many times it's the the pastoral leadership, the way the way he preaches. Is he authentic? Like, does he believe what he's saying or does he have something worth saying? Uh, matters a great deal when it comes to that. I know the people that come to my church and talk about inviting people to my church. It has to do with, you know, my with my preaching and, and my presentation. It's like I that, I mean, that's nice, and I love that compliment. I don't like saying that, or if I invite people to church, I say, well, you know, the pastor's average, um, but the people are good, and it's, you'll, you'll learn something. Hopefully, you'll learn something from it. Uh, but, yeah, that, that is not short-sighted to put emphasis on the pastoral leadership being an important part of the church, at least as we have constructed churches here in the West. Okay. All right. Have we exhausted yeah. that? Let's go to the other part then. What about people who feel that they don't need to be saved because they don't do a lot of bad things. That's what this viewer is concerned about. My, my initial reaction to that is uh, this is not a performance-based relationship. You know, it's a faith-based relationship. I've met many people who do not 
proclaim to be Christians, they're fabulous people. You know, they'll give you the shirt off their back. They feed uh, the needy. They do everything that they can do. And they're really great people. But until they've accepted Christ by faith, then all of that means nothing. And so I, I can be a very good person. Like, like the individuals talking here on this question. Yeah, I, I don't do anything bad. I'm a pretty good person. Well, it's not about your performance. It's about your faith and your relationship with Christ. And that's where the rubber meets the road. So, also, where it also deals with what the, the original sinful nature that passes mm -hmm. through you that's, that has to be dealt with. Wouldn't you say that, Pastor? I, yeah, I share with people when they go, well, you know, I haven't robbed a bank. I haven't killed anybody. I remind them Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden for fruit. They <laughs> ate fruit. They disobeyed God and they ate the, the wrong thing. And it, the, the one part I want to highlight there while we're still on Adam and Eve is Satan's first attack will always be, did God really say? Mm -hmm. And there's a hundred examples yes. today in our culture that says, did God really say in the Bible? Is this mm -hmm. really in the Bible? Did God, because he's always going to go after truth first. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, so, so yes, I share yes. that. But uh, the other thing is, is we're always so quick to say, I haven't done anything that bad because we're comparing to other people. Yep. We're going to come before a judge who has never sinned in all of eternity, past or future. Yes. And in that purity, we're going to smell, we're going to be gray, whatever color or aroma you want to say, yeah. we're not going to measure up. Because it's a different religion that weighs on a scale the good versus the bad. Mm -hmm. In true Christianity, we're sinners who have to be saved yeah. by a yeah. deliverer named Jesus. Yeah, I was going to say, what God is looking for is his son in you and me. Yes, That's right. what he's looking for. We compare our best day to someone else's worst day when it comes to that. And the, the thing that I thought of immediately when I, when I saw this question was, good according to whom? <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. Who is the arbiter of what is good? Is it, well, I haven't, stole, I haven't robbed a bank, I haven't murdered anyone. Well, good for you, you're a responsible citizen. Doesn't mean that you're going to get into heaven with that. And by the way, people who have robbed banks and murdered people, they get access to heaven too through the yeah, blood of Jesus true. Christ. So, you know, the, the idea of, which is a religious idea, and it, it stretches across numerous religions, is, well, if I do 50.1% things good, right. I have access to heaven, whatever heaven looks like. But the Bible clearly teaches that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there's no making up that distance except for repentance and belief in Jesus Christ, which I think is, is good. Like that should be encouraging news. Like, hey, guess what? You don't have to work and slave and do all these things to try and be acceptable to God. If you believe in Jesus Christ and repent of your sins, you are accepted. Yay! You know, you don't have to do all these things, but out of that acceptance and out of that recognition, we should want to do good things. We should want to not rob banks and kill people. You started your soundbite there, Patrick. Talk, you, you hit on something that I'll say it a little bit differently, but um, you know, most people guard or, or um, evaluate themselves by their intentions. They evaluate others by their actions mm -hmm. in a comparison game. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think all everything we're talking about here related to sin, related to need, related to how good, how good is good enough, how bad is bad enough, whatever, is related relationships. I mean, this is where we want to earn the right to be heard, to steal my old Young Life line, and walk with people and allow them to have opportunity and space to be able to talk about tough things, to talk about sin. Two analogies I think of is we used to get a sheet of paper out and we'd write on the back of it, we'd write names down like Mother Teresa, you know, maybe Tim Tebow, Tony Dungy, you know, whoever you think of as a really spiritual, high-level uh, person in a limelight. And we'd say, okay, now where do you rank according to them? And you know, maybe they'd say, well, I'm not quite here, but I am kind of there or whatever and say, okay, so all these people have said they're a sinner. They've all said they're lost. They're also, they're hopeless. So what does that mean for you? Mm. And uh, the other thing we used to use, we used to talk about uh, long jumping the Grand Canyon. Mm. And you could jump really, really far. And I might not jump as far and somebody else might not jump as far as me, but it didn't matter. We're all in, in, in the same place which if you fall at the Grand Canyon, you're done. So I, I think that's a big part, but I think all this to me is, I remember I, I was at a conference in Nashville years ago with our youth pastor at the time, and we talked to someone at the Waffle House, and we were in a great opportunity to evangelize. 
And he was so trying to score a touchdown. And I'm like, dude, just move the chains. Just move the chains. Bill Fay, who was real famous back in the day for evangelism talks, used to say it takes someone 7.6 times to come to Christ. You can be point six, you can be number seven, you can be number three. Just move the chains. But I think most people, you get past the comparison thing, they'll say, yeah, I've, I've sinned today. I've had a bad thought. I used to always say if, if, if the Lord were to show you on a, on a screen my thought life in the last Ooh. 24 hours Ooh. and he played it for everybody to see, I'm the first guy out the door. Like, I don't want people seeing that. Just my thought life, yeah. yet alone yeah. actions. Yeah. And I think most people can come to a realization like, yeah, guilty as charged. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you going to add to that? No, I'm I fine. I, I agree with everything everyone said. Okay. All right, well, we've got a little bit more time. I wanted to, to, to point this out. When surveyed about issues in the community, people re regularly talk about the problem with broken homes and how this creates generations of problems. So often broken homes produce further generations and more broken homes, even among Christians. Can we provide hope for this and make change? And I'm sorry to give you this with only two minutes <laughs> left in the program. But <laughs> we got to do better with fatherhood. We got to do better with marriages. I'm on a marriage board uh, back in Springfield. Mm -hmm. Um, we've seen some good upkeep, but, you know, we know it, without much attention to it, the church is no different than our communities as far as where divorce is. So mm. couples being together, what I said uh, last episode about Andy Stanley uh, mm -hmm. and in his great evangelistic tool of marriages that are flawed, but they're trying to move forward. Um, and then fatherhood is huge in this stuff. The U.S. leads the world in single parent families. Think about that for a minute. I did not know that. Yeah. And if we just kind of take a look at that. Again, we may not have had a perfect example growing up by our parents. Maybe we did have a great example. I don't know. But we need to realize and understand that there's nothing hopeless for God. If we can find ourselves as men and as women or whoever the circumstance is in the family, if we can find our way back to the cross, there's level ground at the cross. If we can, we can figure that piece out as, as pastors and leaders, that's our only hope. There's no other hope in anything else. It's through Christ. And on, and on that note, I, I think we'll leave it at that. And I, I certainly did not know that the U.S. leads the world in single-parent families. That is something to, to take note of. Mm -hmm. Wish we had more time just on that alone. But thank you very much, gentlemen. We appreciate you being with us today. And, uh, and hopefully we've helped a lot of people out there. And incidentally, we'd love to have your, uh, your feedback on this as well as your questions for future programs. So stay tuned for the future as we come back week in week uh, with more good programming for you. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. God bless you for now. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.